Hello and welcome to another edition of Positive Leadership Podcast, the podcast that helps you grow as an individual, a leader, and eventually as a global citizen. Today's episode is all about resilience, the ability to endure and overcome challenges whilst keeping a sense of perspective. Resilience is about seeing opportunity in adversity and moving forward instead of wishing things were different, learning that you have the tools to carry on. My guest, Doug Conant, has shown enormous resilience in his personal and professional life, which propelled himself forward on his leadership journey. Former president and CEO of the Campbell Soup Company, today he draws on his incredible resume and wealth of experience to help aspiring executives hone and master the art of leadership. In his latest book, The Blueprint, Six Practical Steps to Lift Your Leadership to New Health, he sets forth an essential manual for leaders. There's so much I want to ask him, as every chapter is packed full of really fantastic wisdom and insights. It's a real deep pleasure to have you on the podcast, Doug. A warm welcome. Well, thank you very much. I wish I could take you around with me and have you introduce <laughs> me wherever I go. <laughs> if, if you're, I know you don't have much to do. So, uh, like you. Like anyway, you. <laughs> no. Well, thank you very much. I'm very excited to be here. So thank you. Thank you so much. So I'd like to start by asking you about your upbringing. You grew up in the suburbs of Chicago with three younger brothers and a company drive as a tennis player. You describe yourself as an introvert growing up. And I think you even had to pay your Northwestern college by becoming the tennis coach assistant. So can you tell us a bit more about those formative years growing up and all those experiences and your family values instilled the values that have shaped you? Well, uh, I, there's so much to say and so little time. <laughs> but, uh, uh, well, I am the oldest of four boys. So as I often say in my speeches, of course, I am always right. Because <laughs> the oldest is always right. <laughs> and uh, so I grew up uh, and my father was traveling much and so my mother basically had to raise four very rowdy boys hmm. in the uh, in the 60s and 70s which was not easy yeah and uh, she uh, and she survived and so did we <laughs> but uh, uh, as the oldest I was sort of in charge of the next two oldest while she was taking care of the baby uh -huh. and uh, uh, early on, I realized how difficult it was to be a leader. I mean, very early on. If you think about it, uh, and I'll speak about my family today. I yeah. have three children. My wife and I have three children. And to get all five of us, just five of us, to agree on anything in a particular <laughs> direction is a miracle. <laughs> then you start dealing with thousands of people who you don't know nearly as well as the people right. in your own family unit. Yeah. And you see what a challenge it is to to lead when people have their own perspectives and their own minds so I saw that, <laughs> I discovered that very early on tennis was an outlet for me uh -huh. as an introvert uh, you're uncomfortable with people mm -hmm. uh, and I, I, I certainly was but I discovered I could hit a tennis ball against a wall <laughs> for a long time and and it did exactly what I wanted it to do and I didn't have to talk to anyone and uh, I, I became remarkably proficient hitting mm -hmm. against a wall that worked in the winter in the winter it got a little challenging but I went down to our basement and I hit the tennis ball against the basement wall yeah. in a tiny space until my mother would inevitably stop me because that was too annoying so uh, uh, tennis was a great outlet for me as an introvert. I ultimately wrote a blog about tennis, which hmm. included my journey. Yeah. And uh, I found it was excellent preparation for uh, uh, life in terms of learning that uh, uh, pressure was a privilege, a Billie Jean King quote, and learning to perform under pressure when you're the only one out there on the court <laughs> and uh, everyone's watching and uh, and and you have to own the performance. Absolutely. You have to own it. And you quickly learn that you if you want to own the performance on the court, you're, you're pre you have to own the preparation before you go on the mm. court. And so I learned so much from the game of tennis. I, I became relatively proficient at it, although 
as a freshman in mm. high school, uh, they took 40, 40 huh. young freshmen, yep. men, on the tennis team, and I didn't make it. Oh. Out of 40. Out of 40. It's okay. all, it, I, I, all my friends made the tennis team but me. And uh, that's when I got very good at hitting against the wall by myself. Hmm. And uh, the next year I made it. And the next two years I was one of the best players in the Midwest United States. Wow. That earned me a scholarship to Northwestern University yep. where I played. Hmm. And uh, that paid for my education. And then I had the opportunity to work for the – a uh, tennis coach hmm. uh, right after I graduated and and get my graduate school paid for. Wow. So, wow, what a privilege. <laughs> and I went to the Kellogg School hmm. and, it, it, you know, it just yeah. just this year it, it was ranked number two in the United States behind our arch enemy, yeah. Chicago, University of Chicago <laughs> Booth. And, uh, and I had a great education and tennis facilitated a lot of that both just economic financially, yeah. but also in terms of my learned experience. So that's my history in a nutshell. Fantastic. Just developing a little bit uh, that story, Doug, when it comes to tennis. When you had to step up as a coach assistant, I guess you had to, you know, to basically combat your timidity and being introverted to start taking initiative with others, maybe giving advice, maybe leading. Was it a stretch for you? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yes. Yes, it was. <laughs> I can still remember uh, uh, at around the same time, I was taking a, a, a public speaking course at Kellogg uh -huh. the first year. Yep. And I got up for my first speech and I couldn't talk. You couldn't talk it at was, all. <laughs> I couldn't talk. It was embarrassing. Hmm. I had the whole class there and I froze. Wow. Uh, uh, and uh, that was where I started. I'm obviously more comfortable speaking now, but it's taken me uh, almost 50. It's taken me 50 years to, to work <laughs> my way into it. I would say that I did learn something, though. I learned that if I had a deep abiding knowledge of a subject, hmm. I had the courage to speak up. Yeah. And I knew tennis hmm. and I knew tennis players. Hmm. And so, you know, there, there's this wonderful Maya Angelou quote about uh, courage. Yep. She says, courage is the most important trait. Without courage, you can't practice anything else with consistency. And uh, so I'm, I'm big on having courage, but it's hard to have the courage of your convictions if you don't know what your convictions are. Oh, yes. <laughs> and I see many leaders today who aren't or unsure of their hmm. convictions hmm. and they're having trouble manifesting courage in tennis i learned that if i really knew the subject well yeah and i paid attention to the people i could add value and i could have the courage of my convictions and i would speak up if you asked me to speak up in that public speaking course yeah. at the same time yeah i fell short i fell woefully short huh. so that was something i learned as a coach that I needed to really know the content and the people yeah. in order to have the courage, being an introvert, to have the courage to step into the arena yeah. and speak. I, I love it uh, because it, in many ways it reminds me as well. I'm an introvert myself as well. I used to be very, very shy. <laughs> a, a, a bit like you, I mean, uh, my journey has been about, well, first of all, getting some, uh, basically some knowledge, deep knowledge about a topic. Uh, I think mm -hmm. basically content, matter expertise, then being able to build convictions based on that and confidence, and then being able to exercise some courage because of that stronger base. So um, I'm with you 100% and it feels familiar to me as well in terms of the experience. <laughs> yeah, well, I will tell you though, what I've learned as a leader subsequently is that I would never know all the subjects I needed to know as well as I knew tennis. Cool. I mean. Yeah. It was, uh, I could do it in my sleep, yeah. right? I, I knew it that well. Uh, and when I became a general manager and a president and a CEO, the responsibility was enormous. And so what I learned, not only did I have to know the content well, I had to know myself well. Hmm. 
I had to have enough self-confidence yeah. to to stand up knowing that things were going to happen that I would not be prepared for. Yeah. And I had a, you know, in the blueprint of the book you referenced earlier, yeah. We, yeah. we say the only way out of being stuck as a leader is by going in mm. and getting really well grounded in who you are and how you want to show up, uh, knowing right. that you may not have the answers for this conversation, but you can call upon that reservoir of self-knowledge and yeah. experience to help, you know. So that's what I learned as a leader that I tacked on to my experience as an assistant tennis coach. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. So let's build on that dialogue, Doug, and because mm -hmm. early on in your career, when you were a bit older, you were 32, you obviously had oh. to go through a... You want me to relive this? <laughs> oh, no. I put that... Well, I actually wrote about it. So I know you wrote about it, but I, I love you to share the, the wisdom coming of that as well with people. Basically, you were fired from your job at Parker Brothers Toys and Games. It was a big shock, yes. difficult experience in many ways because you had young children and mortgage to pay. So can you take me back to that day and describe what happened and, uh, and explain how it, and how and why it was a crucible moment for you, uh, as Bill George would call it, a crucible yeah yeah well you know uh we all have these crucible moments and that this was certainly one of mine yeah and uh and on one hand you wouldn't wish these moments on anyone and hmm. on, on the other hand it was probably the most important learning experience i had hmm. in my career yeah so it's like you sort of have to go into the fire and learn that you can survive and come out the other side. That test is, I think, a good one. Yeah. But again, I wouldn't wish it on anyone. I went into the office one day yeah. feeling just fine. Uh, the receptionist said, can you go up to see the senior vice president? He needs to meet with you first thing. I went up to see him. I was director of marketing. Yep. And I had a great job. Mm. I mean... <laughs> We were selling toys and games. <laughs> I was I was director of marketing. We had all this cool new stuff, Monopoly, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> all kinds of electronic games, yeah. music, books. And uh, I was the most popular dad on the block. When I would come <laughs> home, they wanted to see what toy I'd brought home. And uh, I was living the life. Yeah. And I go up there and he says, Doug, your job's been eliminated. You need to be out of here by noon. Well. Wow. And 10 years of my career was over in a snap. Wow. I went home to my wife, our two very small children, hmm. and my very large mortgage, feeling hmm. quite the victim. <laughs> and uh, uh, total shock. I'd been with the company, in the, the mother company and the subsidiary for a decade. I felt I was blindsided. Hmm. And I felt a victim. I... Uh, they, did, they were so anxious to get me out of the building, they didn't even tell me my benefits. Wow. Okay. They called me later that day to tell me my benefits, and after the first time I swore at the head of HR and hung up on him, yeah. I called him back, and realizing I really need to get a job. I need some help. So uh, yeah. he connected me with an outplacement counselor. Hmm. This outplacement counselor was a real gift to me. <laughs> uh, I called him that late that day. He said, uh, can you come see me right now? I said, but it's five o'clock. I'd love to make an appointment. I very thoughtful of you to invite me over at the to come to your office yeah. at the dinner hour. Yep. It's about a half hour away. He said, no, you come over right now, and we're going to talk this thing through. Hmm. And I said, wow. Well, thank you. And uh, uh, and I, I drove over there, and he spent the next three hours with me. And he was there for me, and he was there for me completely. And I discovered how important it is when people go through these crucible moments yeah. to be aware that they're going through difficulty uh -huh. and to be there for them completely yeah. in those moments. And, uh, and so that it, it, I started to turn that corner that night. Uh, weeks later, he had me handwrite my life story, which you is the first major learning. Hmm. Uh, he said, Doug, you're presenting yourself as an introvert. We just yep, talked about yep, that. Yep, yep. And you're only answering the questions that are asked. You're not animated at all. You're just telling me what you think I want to hear. Yeah. I'm not seeing the real Doug Conan. Yeah. And I said, I think you need to get in touch with the real Doug Conan. I want you to write your life story. Wow. And I want everything. 
and I want it handwritten because I want I want you to think about what you're writing. Every single word. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, and so I had ended up with around 50 pages of lined notebook paper, both wow. sides, small handwriting, and uh, I wrote about everything. How did you do that? By, oh, by the way, Doug, I'm curious. I mean, is it something that you had to do just obviously by yourself at the time you were not using chat GPT to help you write your own story. But I mean, there did was you, nothing. No, there was I, nothing. I just, but did you talk to yourself, to your wife, to your No, it was friends, just me. Just it was you. my, okay. you know, I think it was important that it was my yeah. journey. Of course. I think I had to travel back and recall and hmm. pull out all the important things that I had learned in my childhood. And I discovered that my family had come to this country uh, in a very challenging times mm. and had persevered mm. and had found ways to make their way through five generations yeah. of citizenship here. And they had grit. They had determination. And they had... Uh, creativity in mm. terms of how they found ways to navigate life. My family, half of them had come from the Irish potato famine in Ireland, the other half from England, mm. and were escaping religious persecution. Yeah. And when I was done, I turned it into him. The good thing is, when you don't have anything to do, you can actually write <laughs> a lot. So I had, in two weeks, I had written 50 pages, both sides. I turned it into him, and he read it, and then he said, Doug, this is very interesting to me. Hmm. I'm, inter I'm we're, we're preparing, helping prepare you to interview for jobs. Yeah. And that, and I see that Doug Conant. Hmm. And then I read this amazing Doug Conant. It's a different one. <laughs> who's a world-class tennis player, who's passionate, who whose family has come from nothing yeah. to pioneer life in the United States. Huh. And th these are two different people. Can you unify you those to, people? <laughs> we need to. You need to be one. One. And and believe me, what the what the people you're talking to need to see hmm. is this, Doug Conan. You've been surviving in your work for a decade by doing what's being asked of you as an introvert hmm. and keeping your head down, being polite, all these things, all of which are wonderful, but they're insufficient. Hmm. You need to bring your whole self to work, and people need to see it, feel it, and hear it, because you have the power to make a real difference. Wow! And what a profound. If I hadn't written that life story and yeah. he hadn't really dove into it, I wouldn't have listened to that from anyone else. But he knew me. Wow! In a way that no one else did. So That's... that was what that experience started me on my journey, and it changed my life. That's a wonderful story, and I think I'm sure you you probably stayed in touch with that person who changed your life. I guess. Oh, he was he was a mentor until he passed. <laughs> he passed. When I called him, he there's yeah. a, one side story about him. Mm. First of all, he almost died in the Argonne Forest in in the World War, wow. and he was left for dead. <laughs> German soldiers stepping over him, thinking he was dead, and he finally <laughs> escaped. Uh, and. Uh, walked with a horrible limp. His name was Neil McKenna. Hmm. And he had seen his share of adversity. Hmm. Uh, and he was tough as nails. He didn't give you a break. You know, <laughs> you, you know, he, he was tough. Yeah. But he looked for he looked for uh, your worth. And uh, uh, and every time I called him, he answered the phone the same way. We had no caller ID. You know, I know it's hard for this audience to understand. Hmm. There were no cell phones. They were yes. just landlines. Yes. <laughs> and uh, he would answer the phone and he would answer it the same way, no matter who was calling. <laughs> Hello, this is Neil McKenna. How can I help? Hmm. He was there to help whoever was there calling. Hmm. If you were the plumber or the delivery person saying, I can't find your house, he was there to help you. <laughs> and uh, he became known for that. He actually ran the outplacement program at Harvard Business School for a while. Wow. Uh, he was very gifted at this stuff, and uh, but it didn't matter who you were. He was there to help. And when he passed away in April of 1996, hmm. no, I'm gonna I'm in April. Uh, I decided I'm gonna make uh, that month. How can I help month? Actually, I, I said I'm gonna make it. How can I help day in my hmm. life? 
I'm going to take the day off yeah. and I'm going to do something helpful. I did that for one year and I said, you know, or the, in one day yeah. and I said, you know, I should be doing this every day. Every day. <laughs> so basically, if you go into my book, you see yeah. one of my principles is bring a how can I help mentality to your work. Absolutely. If you're there to help people, they'll be there to help you. And that all goes back to this mentor, Neil McKenna, who was there for me and there for me completely. I mean, f fantastic again story, and, and it shows us so much, how much helping others and being more of a servant leader can can give you so much back actually in your life. You know, last September, I had on on this on this podcast, I think a friend of yours, Bill George, uh, former Harvard Business professor and best-selling author of Finding Your True North. And he's someone who also places, of course, as you know, a great deal of value in writing your life story as something that helps you to find and vision your intentions, your purpose. So in your book, and you just mentioned that, Doug, you, you talked about your own values, uh, which you said underpin the whole process. And you mentioned how surprised people are when you ask them to do it themselves and that they discover that they have many, let's say, unconscious values that if they had been holding or hiding in some case, but had not fully realized. So can you mm -hmm. talk about how it can be a way of getting to know your internal world in a deeper sense and a way of building resilience? Because in many ways, the, the way you did and you wrote down those worlds and then activated the new DAG, which is something else, is actually embodying the worlds you've been writing is like a big, big transformation. Yeah, always that, always that happening. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, a very uh, powerful observation you just made. Um, the uh, uh, it's I've I've done this work with thousands of people now hmm. uh, since I even when I was a CEO I was running a CEO institute and teaching a lot of this stuff. Yeah. So I've been doing it now for about twenty years, and uh, in an experience based way. I'm one of the few guys who actually practiced all this stuff like Bill George Bill and I are very good friends and uh, we actually did it like Hubert Jolie yep. and you a yep. few others mm -hmm. who've actually done it for an extended period of time and are now trying to help others uh, become more of themselves and uh, so uh, when I in my experience people we, we grow and our life story sort of gets put in the parking lot, <laughs> yeah. if you will, yes. because we are trying to grow and to be the person that Microsoft wants us to be. Yeah. Or in my case, that General Mills wanted me to be or Kraft Foods or RJR Nabisco or Campbell Soup or Avon Products. In all those places, they are telling you how they want you to be. Yeah. And as you're being acculturated into those cultures, you start to lose sight of who you want to be because you're trying to Defeat. meet the needs of the organization, yeah. right? And, uh, and, and part of you gets lost. Hmm. And we find that if we have people write their life story, it's the first step in the blueprint. Yep. And the second step is then reflect on the lessons from that story those first two steps, you can envision a future that's that's helping you become the best version of yourself you can be. Yep. It's almost impossible to do that if you don't mind your life story first. Hmm. Uh, because all of this, what uh, has been called, all this primary greatness is in you already. Yeah. We just have to find it. Yeah. And we don't actually have to find it. You have to find it. And you have to go into your life story so that I have found uh, there are ways with prompts and guidance to mine your life story in a manageable way without having to handwrite 50 pages. Although, if you have time, that's very worthwhile. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, to, to, to go into that parking lot hmm. and find where you actually park the car in that very full parking lot. Yeah. And find the things that matter most. And uh, it... I think it's essential for you to become whole as yeah. a leader. A hundred percent agree with you, Doug. And you know, you, you, I'm sure you know this very famous quote, and I'm not sure I'm going to give it justice. Saying this is a quote saying, 
watch your thoughts before they become your worlds, watch your worlds before they become, I think, your habits, watch your habits before they become your destiny. I mean, um, it's just kind of a shortcut yeah, yeah, version. No, you're there. But, but <laughs> to me, what is the most challenging thing is actually after you verbalize through the worlds your story of your life, yeah, yeah. how do you translate that into your habits and into your destiny, right? That, that's that's, that's well, a, a hell yeah, of a hard work. That, that, yeah. that yeah. can be done. That can be done. Okay. You know, it's amazing to me. I'll go to, you know, we can use Microsoft or I could use any company I've ever yeah. worked with. Uh, it's amazing. We are really good planners. We can have a plan for our our software we can have a plan for a rollout we can have a plan to get into new job we can build a plan man yeah. we are really good planners yeah and then i'll talk to someone and i say what's your plan for your career <laughs> what <laughs> you know you got to be kidding me yeah you know that should be job one yeah and you have you have i'm telling you most leaders are leading by the seat of their pants hmm. they have no plan and you can't just go from here's the leader I want to be with purpose and go to, OK, what habits am I going to have? Yeah, I think you're skipping a few steps. Yeah, you need to. My belief is you envision your future, which is reflecting and then figuring out how you want to show up. Mm -hmm. You study the world around you as you would if you were doing a situation assessment for a business challenge. Yeah, you build a plan. Mm -hmm. And then you say, OK, the next step is how am I going to bring this plan to life with intention? Yeah. And that becomes the practices and the behaviors. And then in the spirit of continuous improvement, hmm. any leader would tell you, you say, OK, how did that go? How can I do better? Yeah. And you go back to the beginning you and you revisit it. Yeah. But the gap here is hmm. that I find leaders don't have a plan. They don't. They're sort of just, you know, they're lost in the desert. <laughs> and it's like, shame on you. You have so much capacity. This is your one life. Yeah. Come on. Let's lean into this. Let's make a plan <laughs> that actually grows out of who you are yep. and who you hope to become in a way that serves your enterprise. And I, there are ways to do this, but we've got to do it with intention. We cannot just do it by the seat of our pants. Yeah. So that's my story and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> I'm sticking to the same story and I think it applies beyond the professional life itself, I think, Doug. It applies to our whole life as one life, right? Uh, transcending pro professional, personal, and social life together. Ideally, you want to bring that all together in one one plan <laughs> as opposed to yeah. many, many plans, I guess. And that's how. Well, that's yeah. <laughs> David Brooks, the New York yeah. Times social commentator, has the his book, The Second Mountain. Yeah. He talks about it. building your resume and writing your eulogy and how do those things come together as one. Yeah. And uh, and that's what we're talking about. Yeah. Uh, when you when you pass away, people are not going to talk about your career accomplishments. For sure. They're going to talk about your career, con your life contributions and how you've affected those around you. Uh, and I think we do need to bring it together as one. But I also believe we can. I don't, it will never be elegantly perfect. Yeah. Because as Jim Collins used to say, perfect is the enemy of good. Mm -hmm. But it can be good and getting better all the time in the spirit of continuous improvement. Uh, the, the leaders I work with are so focused on, I want to get this just right. Yeah that they don't get started, it, yeah, you know, they're stuck. and yeah. uh, and the, the famous quote, Teddy Roosevelt and Arthur Ashe, you, uh, and I will get this about as wrong as you got that last quote. Uh, <laughs> uh, you start with what you have, where you are, and you do what you can. Yeah, yeah. And that's the mindset we try to have leaders bring to the table. They've got enough in there already. That's and we just got to get on the right road. Yeah. And then they can. It's amazing what they can accomplish. So no, that's what I think. I love it. So let's come back as well to your own life story development. So you move from the refrigerator, refrigerator division of Kraft to take care of Nabisco biscuits, <laughs> moving from marketing to sales, eventually president <laughs> of Nabisco before being back to Kraft, which acquired Nabisco. So it's a, I mean, it's, a, it's an incredible kind of business story as well. And then you were approached to become the CEO of Campbell, Campbell's Soup Company. 
that must have felt like an enormous step at the time. So tell me about those early days as you, again, joined the company to become a CEO and the challenge sure. you faced to reset Campbell, because I think it was a full reset you had to do. Well, uh, first of all, uh, I was at Kraft for seven years. After I was fired, yeah. I, it took me a year because I was a terrible interview. Hmm. Uh, <laughs> uh, but I got a job with Kraft and I had it for seven years. And once I got into Kraft and I didn't have to interview anymore, I, I did pretty well and I became head of corporate strategy at Kraft. Yep. And the CEO, a fellow by the name of Jim Kiltz, fantastic CEO, hmm. uh, loved me being in strategy, but I, I hungered to be you know the drill. I yep. hungered to be leading the business and yep. helping lift the company to greater heights. And I had a team of f three to five people trying to chart yep. strategy, which was interesting but insufficient. Yep. I did it for three years. And then I was recruited into RJR Nabisco right after Barbarians at the Gate, hmm. the world's large, the largest LBO yeah. in history to this day <laughs> in the consumer products industry. Uh, 25 billion dollar LBO yeah and uh, in 1989 and I went in there and that was like the Wild West <laughs> while I was there I got a general manager job I just took the job because I was fascinated by the challenge of going into what I would call the shark tank uh -huh. in New York City <laughs> after I was working for a Midwestern Chicago based food company hmm. I went to the shark tank I took the small. I took a uh, the smallest division they had yep. as a general manager, and I was loving it. And before I knew it, they said we'd like to move you to marketing in the biscuit division. <laughs> and I said I don't want to do that. I <laughs> want to be a general manager. Yeah, this felt like a bait and switch. They said we need you to go there, so I went. Yeah, and I had we had a great run. We went from horrible performance to the best performance in the history of the company hmm. in terms of revenue growth and earnings growth in in an LBO environment <laughs> in two years. Then they said, well, you did good there. Now we want you to move to sales. Mm. And I said, do I have a choice? I'm riding the <laughs> wave here. We finally got this right. And the CEO said, yes, you have a choice. And I said, well, I don't want to go. <laughs> the next day, I get a phone call from uh, Rita, who was the CEO's executive assistant. Mm. And I said, Rita, what is this call about? She said, well, John would like to see you. And I said to her, I said, Rita, choice. do I have a choice today? <laughs> she said, no, yesterday you had a choice. <laughs> today you're going to take the job. So I went in and uh, I had declined the job when he first offered it to me. I said, you got to be kidding me. I am not a salesman. I'm an introvert and I can't play golf. Why in the world do you want me talking to customers? He said, well, we need some thought leadership here as well as some interpersonal leadership and we think you're the guy for the job. Hmm. So I, I I said the second time I said I'd love to do it because I knew I didn't have a choice. Yep. And I did that and that led me to becoming president of Nabisco Foods. We transformed the sales organization and uh, that led to Nabisco Foods. Then we were acquired by Kraft, the company I had left. Right. Yep. At which point I said, uh, I'm, uh, I can't go back. You know, it's like going back to high, a high school reunion. <laughs> I could not go back to high school again. I need to be moving forward. Yeah. And uh, so I was recruited to be CEO of Campbell. Hmm. Campbell at the time was headquartered in the poorest, most dangerous city in the United States, a little place called Camden, New Jersey, hmm. 75,000 people. 70, 70 murders a year wow. in a town of 75,000 people. Yeah. The world headquarters was surrounded by razor wire, razor wire and had <laughs> guard, uh, guard posts, yeah. Yeah. Uh, ostensibly to make you feel safe, <laughs> but you felt like you were going to work in a minimum security prison. <laughs> and uh, they had lost half their market value in one year. They had downsized dramatically hmm. and were uncompetitive. We did the work to say, discover we were of the top 21 food companies in the world. We were the poorest performing one <laughs> uh, and uh, headquartered in the 
fourth most dangerous city in the United yeah. States. Yeah. And people were saying, why did you take this job? <laughs> then we did a Gallup survey, hmm. which said not only is your performance terrible, but your employee engagement cool. is the worst in the Fortune 500. The bottom. Okay. Well, wow. at the yeah. bottom. Yeah. 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 Number yeah. 500 out of 500. Two. And uh, so uh, <laughs> we that's where my belief yeah. and this this will come out as yeah. we continue to talk here. Yeah. But yeah. I I just don't believe you can win in the marketplace unless you first create a winning formula for winning in the workplace. Yeah. You have to have a winning culture if you're going to compete with well heeled companies. Uh, on a global level, yeah, you have to really have a high performance ethic, and you have to have a spring in the step culture. Hmm. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah. You have that at Microsoft. So let, let me let me let, let me build on that, uh, Doug. Uh, thanks for you know making sharing with us actually those uh, pretty amazing career moves and and the plans you had or maybe lack of plans in some cases, but at least you are called on the next steps steps you have to do. I found some interesting similarities in the way you reshape Campbell culture and the way we evolved our culture at Microsoft. You know, back in 2014, mm. when Satya Nadella and all of us transformed our company into a cloud and AI first organization with a new mission to empower every person and every organization on the planet to achieve more. So, can you elaborate on the culture framework you've designed? And more importantly, the way you made it real with your people, because I think it takes more than a slide and some words on a slide to to shape or create or reinvigorate the culture, uh, and particularly getting all of your employees again to engage, to be motivated, and to bring their their best version of themselves. What did it take? It was a heavy lift um, <laughs> to. Uh, to put it in perspective, uh, uh, our performance, uh, uh, we were also, in addition to all the other things, we were being investigated by the U.S. government, multiple agencies for uh, malfe financial malfeasance hmm. while we were dealing with everything else. And uh, that's where uh, we had to start. Uh, uh, my foundational belief is you can't ask associates to care about the enterprise hmm. until you first demonstrate that you care about them Absolutely. and their agenda. Yeah. They got to come first and then you earn credibility and respect and they start to lean into the proposition of the enterprise. And in my opinion, what you did at Microsoft is you reaffirmed the value of every person. You honored them in a way that was noticeable. Hmm. And that's what I tried to do at Campbell. Yeah. And I had a lot of practices that did that. But it was really about placing a premium on honoring people, on uh, demonstrating that we cared about things, people and performance. Yep. And then that we, uh, we brought it to life in tangible ways, hmm. tangible actions. Uh, and uh, that we were... Uh, when Jim Collins did his good to great work, yeah. he identified two characteristics of his level five leaders. Hmm. Uh, and I, they really spoke to me as an introvert. I think they speak to you too. Yeah. The two characteristics of enduring successful companies were humility and fierce resolve. Yeah. So hmm. we, with all humility, we said, we're in this together. We're going to have to lift ourselves up and, and we are not. We are going to see this through. We'll have realistic expectations, but we will be relentless. Mm. The first three years, we said we're going to go from being uncompetitive every day to being competitive on a good day. Mm. And it will take us three years in a in a highly developed consumer goods category, yeah. food, food, yeah, that yeah. is very competitive. Mm. We were in 38 countries. It was complex, and uh, and so we said it's. We had realistic expectations, and then we had fierce resolve. The other thing we said was every leader has to demonstrate that they have the capacity to inspire trust. Hmm. Trust building was job one, not job, not a nice to have. It was a must have. Foundation, yeah. And we told all the leaders, particularly the top 350, that if you aren't building trust in your organization, we're going to measure it through Gallup. Hmm. You are at risk. Wow. 
whatever the is your, year, whatever is your performance, year, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. And the first year, I'm not even going to look at it. Yep. That's going to be your baseline. Yep. The second year, I'm going to look at it, and we're going to talk about it, every one of the 350. And the third year, we're going to act on the learning. Hmm. And if you can inspire the trust of the organization and deliver the performance, there were six expectations, but it, or five expectations, yep. one, two, three, four, five, six. six, six expectations. First one was inspire trust. If you can't get with the program, we've got to find leaders that will. Yeah. We'll move you to into an individual contributor mode or something else. But in three years, we've got to transform this culture. Hmm. And that means we've got to transform the leadership of this culture. And I don't think people expected me to last three years. <laughs> Uh, I did, and uh, and we did transform the culture in those three years. But I think, as you know, ultimately we turned over 300 of our top 350 leaders. Wow. I don't know. Hmm. And I, think of Microsoft. Oh, it's huge. Three years. Yeah. 300 of the top 350 it's left huge. the organization. Gigantic. Yeah. But on the other hand, I felt like uh, fiddler on the roof. Hmm. There is no other hand. Yeah, we have to make these changes or we won't survive. Yeah, and uh, so we did, and we survived, and then we thrived. L l love the way you build that foundation of trust by honoring people, uh, Doug. We'll come back to that because I think it's uh, mm -hmm. at the nucleus of your philosophy. So, yeah. I mean, as we've been discussing for a little while now together, there's clearly a big difference between the Doug who was at Parker Brothers Toys and Games and the Doug at Campbell Soup Company. And reading your book, when you're reading your book, which I really suggest to all my listeners, you get a real sense of your personal and professional transformation. So when did you first start thinking about leadership in the way you do now and the essential nature of creating a blueprint? And when did you start realizing that having a framework for leadership would not only impact your journey, but will help many others on their own path? Well, uh I needed a lot of help. I wasn't a natural. So, uh, you know, when they talk about our leaders born or made, I'll tell you every time they're made. Yeah, agree. If you want to be a great leader in today's tumultuous times, you better be working at it. It's like a craft, right? It's a, And it works off a mastery model. If you want to master this craft, you got to work at it every day and you have to do it with intention. So yeah. that's my belief. In my case, I lost my job. And that was a wake-up call. I got another job, and that became a, a good working situation, but insufficiently fulfilling. Hmm. I then went to the world's largest LBO, which was the Wild West. <laughs> if you read the book or saw the movie Barbarians at the Gate, it was <laughs> crazy. Hmm. Uh, and I was being tested, and I was losing. I, it was, I was in over my head. And, you know, they say... Uh, uh, when the student is ready, ready the teacher appears. Mm. I would also tell you that when the reader is ready, the book appears. <laughs> and I bought a book uh, in an airport in the early 1990s, and I started reading it, uh, and I, just, I, I was so moved by it that I followed up on it. Hmm. It was called The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, and it was written by Stephen Covey. Yeah. And I felt like at that moment, he was speaking to me. Mm. I felt rudderless yeah. in very stormy seas. And so he was a powerful influence on me in my life. I went out and worked with him, got to know his entire team, uh, and worked on sort of finding what Bill George would say, my own true north. Yeah. What Stephen Covey would say is, you, what's your mission in life? Hmm. What's your personal mission? Yep. How do you want to show up? Yeah. And and so I started getting exposed to this wisdom literature. I worked with Stephen Covey, many others, <laughs> and I started to learn all these things that said, you know, it's there's so much here. I can find my way through this, but I do. I had to work at it. Hmm. And uh, and then I guess I a couple other influences. Uh, Bill George was a big one. Hmm. Uh, he, he's a decade ahead of me, and I've been drafting off of his <laughs> experience for now two decades that we've known each other. And then Warren Bennis became a very good friend before he passed away. Hmm. 
he he uh, my first book was published under his uh, collection of books and Warren had this great quote that said which really pulls all this together hmm. he said you know becoming a leader is all about you becoming yourself hmm. it's 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 that easy and it's precisely that difficult that's why it's so hard and this whole journey <laughs> yeah I feel like I'm myself more myself today there's nothing new here I'm just peeling away my potential that's probably been there all along <laughs> I, lo I love it. You know, you and I were, were having a quick discussion the other day, uh, Doug, on on this very fast changing world, uh, you know, uh, yeah. that we used to call VUCA, right? Uh, volatile, uncertain, complex, ambiguous. And you and of course, you share with me that, hey, Jean-Philippe, you know, JP, this has changed. This is no bunny, right? It's about yeah. brittle, anxious, nonlinear and incomprehensible. So can you share with our listeners, not just, of course, the context of Bunny is quite interesting, but the way you've been shaping those three easy steps to become the best version of yourself, to become a leader, because you made it super easy, like one, two, three. You started talking about a one. I'd love you yeah. to elaborate on the two and the three as well. Sure. Uh, well, first of all, every generation seems to need to have a new word for <laughs> what the generation is going through. Uh, so this new word that I came, that I encountered in the last month or so, uh, banning, yeah. uh, it speaks to me. I mean, and and what I, I'm I, I'm in an office today in Washington D.C. and the average age here is probably under 30, hmm. and they have never seen anything like this world. You and I have seen yeah. more, yeah. right? We have experience, yeah. but uh, uh, what I have learned is. Uh, that of Banny, brittle, anxious, nonlinear, yeah. incomprehensible, A is the big word now. Hmm. Anxiety is at an all-time high for generations of workers who have never faced this kind of chaos. Yeah. And uh, the volume of what's coming at them is greater. The speed at which it's coming at them is greater. Yeah. And the, the architecture that is supporting them is crumbling. It is. And they used to be able to go when I started. Of course, I'm old. You're young. Uh, <laughs> but, well, you're younger anyway. You're not that young. Not, not that young, no, but, no. <laughs> but uh, I guess when I started, I used to be able to go to some my manager and say, how do I do this? Hmm. Yeah. I, you know, I'm not sure. Uh, now you can't go ask your manager. Your manager doesn't know. Doesn't they know. have 20 direct reports, yep. and they're coordinating and aligning and yep. motivating, but yep. they're not doing. Yep. And so uh, the anxiety is an all-time high. Yeah. And then I'm wor I'm working with uh, people that you compete with in Silicon Valley. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm talking to the CHROs, and they are saying, "This is what a nightmare." Our anxiety is at an all-time high. Yeah. You know, all these layoffs and all this stuff. Yeah. And I, I say that's really interesting because here in the United States, layoffs are at a three-decade low. <laughs> a three-decade low. Yeah. But in Silicon Valley, it's they're high. Yeah. And they've never seen anything like it. That's right. Yeah. And all they know is that one sector. Hmm. And so it's like the... The sky is crashing down. Yep. Anxiety is an all-time high, and they think, oh, the world's coming down. Hmm. And in every other sector I talk to, they're having trouble hiring people. Yeah, Absolutely. But when I talk to <laughs> the technology sector, it's like, oh, no. And so what we say is, if you want to find your way through this, you've really got to get your rudder in the water hmm. because I guarantee you the seas will get choppier. Yeah. So... What kind of leader do you want to be? Hmm. That's the first thing. first thing. And it grows out of your leadership story and your reflection. Yeah. And a little bit on studying leaders around you who you can learn from. Yeah. And then building a plan for how you want to move forward mm -hmm. to become more effective. Yeah. And then implementing some simple practices. And the key here is it, I draw a lot of learning from uh, James Clear and his book, Tiny Habits, mm -hmm. Atomic Habits, Atomic, Atomic Habits, Habits yeah. Atomic, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but the key to this change process is it has to nest 
perfectly hmm. in your cockamamie life. <laughs> You know, we all have diets that we're going to implement right after the holidays. Yep. And we we do them with great rigor for one month, and then we can't sustain it. It's gone. Yeah, yeah. So what we try and do with this is keep it remarkably simple. Hmm. Figure out your purpose. Figure out how you want to show up, and then find tiny habits or practices that can start to bring that version of yourself to hmm. life with the people with whom you live and work. Hmm. Small changes can have big impact. And it is literally, if you keep it simple, yep. you can sustain it. If if you try, we all, you know, all of our organizations, all the companies I talk to, you know, the, uh, there's a quote, uh, uh, I'd rather have a good plan well executed than a brilliant plan poorly executed every time. <laughs> and as we talked about earlier, most of our organizations are filled with brilliant people who can create brilliant plans. We yeah. just can't do them no. <laughs> in an enduring way. Yeah. We have to bring that mindset to our own leadership journey. And that's what we talk about. No, I love it. Lo love those very uh, smart advice, uh, Doug, particularly these days. You know, recently also had the opportunity to have a great dialogue with Stephen M. R. Covey on his book about the trust and inspire leader. Uh, he talked about the three stewardships of trust and inspire leader. Modeling who we are, trusting how you lead, and inspiring connected to the why. Interesting enough, your core framework starts with honor people, followed by inspire trust, <laughs> and then mm -hmm. clarify higher purpose. So I think in, in many ways I found, of course, some very strong correlations and you know and symmetries between the trust, inspiration, purpose factors. But I think you've got something very special that you already talked about. I'd like you to use some other example on the way you honor people, because I think you've been practicing that for a long time in your professional, personal life. You talked about what you did at Campbell Soup, but I know you started okay. actually writing down notes <laughs> to a lot of people in an incredible way, very personal way. Can you share that story a bit more? Well, I think as a leader, you have to have uh, you, uh, I think you have to declare yourself, say, here's what I'm going to do, and then you have to do it in very tangible ways. And I, I talk about honoring people, and they say, well, how are you going to do that? Well, there are lots of ways, but my personal way as an introvert was to write notes to people who I might not see otherwise. Yep. And uh, I, I started a practice actually back in my mother would take credit for it. She made me write thank you notes to people ah, after the holidays. Okay. And uh, so I've got to give credit to my mother. That's another uh, life story that was in the parking lot for me that I lost sight of. Get you. And uh, so I started handwriting notes to people saying thank you. It wasn't just wishing them happy birthday or something, but they yeah. had done something good for our company, and mm. I wanted to acknowledge it and let them know I was paying attention and that it was appreciated. <laughs> I find that all of our organizations are great critical thinking machines. We're built to find what's wrong and fix it. Yeah. But even in the most broken companies I've been in, two of which were an old economy canned soup company and the world's largest LBO, even in those companies, eight out of ten things were being done right. Hmm. But nobody was talking about those things. Yeah. So I needed to bring balance. So I started writing 10 to 20 notes a day to employees six days a week. I had a process where I was in a car two and a half hours going to work every day. I would write 10 to 20 notes to people, small, short notes on specific subjects. Mm. And uh, they would go out the next They would go out that day based on information I had learned the prior day. So it was on time, handwritten, personal. And uh, uh, when I retired, uh, I was asked how many notes I had written. I had no idea. <laughs> so we did the math. Yeah. And it turned out at least just to Campbell employees, yep, yep. I've written 30,000 notes, 30,000. And we only had 20,000 wow. employees. <laughs> so wherever you would go in the world, in yeah. the 38 countries, you would see one of my notes tacked up on in the a wall. cubicle, say, wow. thank you for helping out on this project or over delivering the quarter on sales and earnings, wow. or whatever it was. And do uh, you think people noticed? over time. Yeah. I think all my direct reports said, do you expect us to write notes? <laughs> I said, no, but I do expect you to celebrate contributions of significance. Yeah. 
this is more than just problem solving. Absolutely. This is company building. Mm. And we've got to build a culture that celebrates what's working while we deal with all the stuff that's not working. So, I mean, there's no mystery the way you basically came with Campbell's Soup from the bottom of the pack, of the pack, right, in terms of mm -hmm. employee engagement to the very top in a few years. Because you basically yeah, we, did it, you meant it, one, one employee at a time, which is quite, quite amazing, actually, in terms yeah, well. of the intention and the practice you built into the company. Uh, this is where courage matters, though. Uh, yeah, yeah. I didn't know my ass from my elbow hmm. to be a CEO when I took the job. I had studied it, but I'd never been one. Yeah. And I picked this path because I believed it was right, but I, had, I was in uncharted water. And so the path, <laughs> thank goodness it worked, uh, or you wouldn't be talking to me right now. <laughs> uh, but it did work, and I will tell you, it does work. Everywhere I go, I yeah. see just what you're doing at Microsoft, building organization capacity and a spring-in-the-step culture. Yeah. L let's have the last couple of questions. Unfortunately, because the time is moving so fast, Doug, it's such a fascinating discussion. I'd like to shift gears and talk about the importance of support networks in helping us overcome adversity. I really like the idea of building a strong relationship, keeping a regular contact, repaying favors, feeling mutual benefit relationship in good and bad times as well. Uh, so have you got some tips on how to start and maintain meaningful relationships, especially as you'll be able to relate to if you are naturally more introverted? That's not necessarily an obvious step. <laughs> Yeah, well, th this is important. You know, they say, and you know this, they say leadership is lonely at the top. Yeah. I find it was lonely at every level. <laughs> but what I discovered was that the, uh, uh, it was only, lo it didn't have to be. I was making a choice. I wasn't talking to anybody about it. And I discovered there were plenty of people who were interested in helping me as long as I respected them and honored them and didn't ask too much of them. So uh, when I lost my job, hmm. I was challenged by my outplacement counselor, Neil McKenna, to build a network of people yep. who could give me ideas and advice on my job search. Hmm. Believe it or not, I was 33, I'm now 72. Some of those same people are in my network today. Still today, wow. Still today. <laughs> uh, and we've all grown together. <laughs> I could call them and help them, or they could call me and I would help. I mean, uh, so I, f I think you want to build that relationship. And then you've got to, with intention, and it's not the intention to get something from it. It's all about having the intention to give something to it. It's, it, it's all about, I find the more I give, the more I get. Yeah. So in this, in this network idea, hmm. build a network where you think you can be adding value, where you're always looking to add value. And then what I find is, People are looking to add value to me. And so it's about giving, not getting. Yeah. And I have found if I can get a reference from someone, if I, if I contact someone, you give me the name of someone, and I, I send them an email and I say, JP suggested we talk. Yeah. I'd love to get your ideas and advice on something. Yeah. Uh, they'll take a call. Yeah, exactly. And then if I'm, if I'm clear about what I'm asking, they'll give me five to 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. And then I'll and I'll try and create some value for them, and then we'll see where it goes. And most often, those relationships are will stick. Absolutely. Then you need to have some discipline. Yeah. To maintain them. To nurture. And yeah. My, and my advice mm. is, if you're just starting on this, mm. do it now before you need it, not yeah. when you're fired. Yeah. Do it now, <laughs> and and if you if you start with five people. Mm -hmm. You're off to the races. Who are five people who you would really love to have in your network, and how can you connect with them in some way? Yeah. And if you can't get them now, maybe you can get them later. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, when I was doing this at first, I would have had Jack Welch at the top <laughs> of my list at the time. Yeah. And uh, and you know, and it turns out he grew up in the town that my family founded mm. in 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 the United States. Mm. So. Uh, I never could have reached Jack Welch. Eventually, I did and had a good relationship with him and learned a lot about what to do and what not to do. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, it takes time. But pick five 
and go at it and try and find a way to build that relationship with references from people you admire. Yeah. And it's amazing what you can do. And then you nurture them in some manageable, thoughtful way. No, it's so important to develop that powerful network of meaningful relationship and nurture them all along the way. Uh, I'm with you, uh, Doug. In 2009, Doug, uh, you're returning home from work at Campbell's where you, where, when you are involved in a near fatal car crash. And daughter spent spend 18 hours putting your back together. Your wife stay with you until you woke up from surgery and you talk in the past about how she said three words that have made a huge impact on you and your leadership model. What were those worlds and the power of those well, worlds? Well, I, uh, I was 59 years old. It was July 2nd, 2009. And uh, indeed, that's what happened. Uh, and I'm, in my talks, I say I am living proof that you can put Humpty Dumpty back together again. <laughs> and uh, I was in the ICU. Uh, my, they got my wife to the trauma center where I was being kept. And she would not leave my side. I'm anecdotally, I'm told. I was out for hours yeah. uh, in the bed, and she was holding my hand the entire time. And I learned from the nurses later on that they were all offering to spell her. Would you like to stretch your legs? Would you like to go have a comfort break? She said, no, I'm going to stay right here. I want to be here when he wakes up. Hmm. I want to be here for him. And she knew I was <laughs> squeamish in hospitals, having given birth to three children. And hmm. I, she was fine. I hyperventilated when we were having our babies. Hmm. Uh, so uh, uh, at any rate, um, <laughs> and she was right there. I woke up and she was holding my hand. She was the first person I saw, the first person I touched that I was cognizant. And uh, she said three words to me. She said, I'm right here. Hmm. She says that she only said two words, I'm here. <laughs> but, and I was on drugs at the time. So <laughs> she's probably right, but I say three words, I'm right here. Yeah. The important thing was she was there for me. Hmm. And she was there for me right when I needed her. Yeah. Right when I needed her. And that was another crucible moment in mm. my life. And what I tell people is, metaphorically, the people we work with every day are in a car accident. Something has gone wrong. Yeah. And what I coach leaders to do is, you don't have to solve it. But what you do have to do is say, I'm right here. How can I help? I'm right here. What happened? Yeah. And that will open the door to a relationship that will grow and prosper. You just have to be fully present in those crucible moments. And we all have them in, in large scale or small scale every day. Indeed. And we tend to get so caught up in our own moments yeah. that we're not paying attention to the moments around us. And the mark of a great leader is to be tuned in to the world around you and not preoccupied with the world inside. Uh, so that's my story. Wonderful and so powerful. So, I mean, we such strong, strong words. Let me ask you the, the very last question. I recently had Sir Ronald Cohen on the podcast and he had a sort of epiphany moment on his 60th birthday. And he decided to leave his job as a venture capitalist and do something that he considered to be more important, more impactful, more purposeful. He realized that giving back was one of his core values. So, Doug, I mean, what do you feel called to do? What are your dreams? How do you want to make the world a better place? What inspires you? And what are you working towards? In 25 words or less. Sure. <laughs> uh, no, you know... I am doing what I was called to do, and I was doing it when I was serving these companies. I was helping people realize their full potential. Mm -hmm. My purpose as a leader is to help leaders find joy, fulfillment, and impact while they build high-trust, high-performance teams that honor people, defy the critics, and thrive in the face of adversity. That's my stated purpose. Mm -hmm. I've been walking that talk and living into that purpose for 40 years. Mm -hmm. I find it remarkably fulfilling and 
just to see people have these moments where they've gone a step further than they might have gone is just so fulfilling to me. Uh, and today I'm paying that forward. Uh, and, and I can't imagine anything more fulfilling at this point in my, uh, I, for a cockamamie reason, we keep track of the people that have worked either for me directly for me or one level down that I have worked with. We keep track of how many CEOs there are (laughs) and we have nearly 60 now. (laughs) And, uh, those 60 people, my opinion, are better off for having known me. And I have had some influence on their journey. And I see the influence they're having Repo on the effects. journeys of their companies around the world. Yeah. And, uh, and that's where I can add value because I know what it's like to be in the arena, just like you do. Mm-hmm. I'm not opining on it from some academic chair somewhere. Yeah. I've, I've, I've been there, done that. Yeah. You've been there, done that. And I can help. Uh, I can help them find their footing. I'm not trying to tell them how to live their lives, but I can help them find their footing in a way that will lift their enterprise up. And I love doing it. I can't imagine anything better. <laughs> what a wonderful conclusion, uh, Doug. I mean, I'm right here. What can I help? To me, that's probably one of the best cuts I would have in my Positive Leadership podcast from a Wonderful positive mm-hmm. leader. Thank you so much for this uh, amazing moment we spent, Doug, and and wish you the very best in uh, accomplishing your purpose one day at a time. Thank you, and I look forward to the next time our paths cross. I think it, I love the work that's going on within your company now, and I am cheering you all on from the sidelines. Thanks so much, Doug. Thank you. All the best. Thank you.